Welcome to The Gangster, book six in the Galactic Football League series. Written and performed by Scott Sigler, The Gangster is suitable for ages 12 and up and contains graphic violence. The Gangster is also available as a signed, numbered, limited edition hardcover while supplies last. To order, go to scottsigler.com slash store. Hello, junkies. Welcome to episode number nine of The Gangster. To keep you up to date on the riveting drama that is the Mount Fitzroy ratings and reviews over on Audible, we are well over 1,000 reviews. Thank you very much. And closing in on 1,300 reviews with an overall rating of 4.9. If you have listened to Fitzroy and haven't left a review and a rating, please do so because that helps a whole stinking bunch. And speaking of Audible, they have, uh, you know, they ponied up a little bit of cash to advertise in this episode, which you will hear in the middle of this episode. Yes, yes, I know. It's super annoying. So pinch that nose and hold your breath, junkies, because it only takes one lousy minute. Then you are right back in the story again. Things are starting to get interesting for Quentin and company. Let's get you caught up on the story so far, and then we'll jump right into it. Previously on The Gangster, the nerve damage to Quentin's arm is so severe it can't be repaired, or can it? Quentin, Becca, Chodo, and Fred arrive in New York City on Earth to visit Doc Ganagati Sports Medicine Clinic, where Quentin will be tested to see if he's suitable for a dangerous experimental therapy that could put him back on the field. NYC. New York City, one of the galaxy's most densely populated places, outside of Sklerno territory, of course. At over a thousand years old, New York City was eight centuries older than the entire Purist nation. Frederico Esteban Gesipe Gonzaga drove the cab, following the sixth layer traffic over Central Park towards 69th Street. Quentin and Becca rode in the back. Exactly where Fred had acquired a cab, Quentin didn't know. Fred merged with the 69th Street traffic. Once past 3rd Avenue, he dropped down, slowed, and eased up against the 5th layer receiving deck of Randall Hospital. Safe and sound, Fred said. I'll circle the block for as long as you're in there, so I'll be close. Chodo has a comm. Have him signal me if I'm needed. Becca patted Quentin's knee. Still feel silly, Q? A long trench coat helped hide his bulk, and he had to wear a hat for high one's sake. I feel utterly ridiculous, he said. Becca slid sunglasses on his face. You look good, she said, all tall, dark, and mysterious. He huffed, like this getup will fool anyone. Becca opened the cab door. The city's heat billowed in. Quentin started sweating even before he followed Becca onto the receiving deck. Fred guided the cab away from the building, then merged into New York's insane, multi-layered traffic. Cars honked angrily, air bikes banked in and out, free-flying hurrah and Kretorakians zipped around over and under the vehicles. Quentin glanced across the deck. A few heads turned his way, a few passing glances, but no one seemed to know who he was. Not yet, anyway just sentience gawking at a seven-foot-tall human man and his six-foot-six heavy G girlfriend. She was a head taller than most. He, too, heads taller. Despite his anxiety about being recognized, he took a moment to soak in the spectacle. Compared to the towering, multi-layered megasprawls of the Sklorno dynasty, New York City was downright parochial. Compared to McCovey, however, and the city's Quentin had seen in his PNFL days, The Big Apple size seemed beyond measure. He looked east, down 69th. He could barely make out the seawall. Ten meters high, two meters thick, it surrounded the island of Manhattan, keeping the rivers at bay. Between the wall and where he stood, so many massive, towering buildings. Massive and ancient. Some looked to be four or five centuries old. Weathered, battered, 
protected by Planetary Union law as historical relics. But not all the buildings were old. He glanced up. Randall Hospital, obviously built just a few years earlier, soared 120 stories tall. The best facility in the galaxy for sports medicine, or so the story went. Inside the building, Ganagati and a battery of specialists awaited him. If they couldn't fix his arm here, his arm couldn't be fixed. Let's get in there, Becca said, before someone recognizes my favorite football star. Football star? Was he anymore? Chodo stood at the hospital's entrance door. As a two-time Galaxy Bowl winning linebacker, Chodo was famous in his own right, instantly identifiable to many. Becca had given him a disguise as well. He wore his usual gray sweatpants, but also a long black trench coat and a sunglass. With just one lens for the quith single eye, the word sunglasses didn't apply. The warrior looked as ridiculous as Quentin felt. The facility appears to be secure, Chodo said. I have been traversing the interior for the last 30 minutes. I have detected no threats. A select few hospital staffers are aware of your visit and have cleared a private room for your needs. They said they have a full day's worth of tests prepared. Oh, joy, Quentin said. I'm so good at tests. Quentin said his goodbyes to Becca. Maybe the Randall staff could fix her neck pain. They'd also give her a full-body examination, ensure there was no hidden damage incurred during the season, the playoffs, or the Galaxy Bowl, where she had taken a beating. Little things, like hidden muscle tears and skeletal microfractures, could grow into larger injuries down the road. They put Quentin in a private room on the 30th floor, complete with a hospital bed, holo tanks, and monitoring equipment. He spent the afternoon wearing nothing but a surgical gown, wondering if hospitals kept rooms refrigerator cool on purpose. Twenty-odd doctors and other specialists came and left. Each time they entered, they had to answer intimidating questions from Chodo, who stood guard outside the room. The staff, including Ganagati, poked Quentin, prodded him, scanned him, drew blood, took tissue samples, and in general treated him like a lab animal. Ganagati repeated many of the same tests she had performed on the regulator. Was she being thorough or just covering her ass for when she delivered bad news? Her final test involved a multiple needle probing of Quentin's nervous system from his left shoulder down. This will sting a bit, Ganagati had said. Those words established that she was like all other doctors in at least one way. She lied a lot. Ghana Gotti instructed Quentin to dress, then left the room to give him privacy. Quentin did as he was told. When the door slid open again, he expected to see the hurrah doctor float in. Instead, Becca entered, dressed in her street clothes. She slid the door shut behind her. She seemed spaced out, shuffling more than walking. B, you okay? She looked at him, her dazed eyes blinking as if she only now realized he was standing there. Huh? Oh, yeah, I, I'm good. Had they given her drugs? You look out of it. They find something during your exam? She nodded. Yeah, kinda. Uh, nothing to worry about, though. I'll tell you later. How about you? Are we back in the football business? I'm waiting on my results. She stepped to him, took both his hands, her now familiar gesture of support. You get any vibes from Ganagati? No. Quentin said. She's cold as ice. Becca squeezed his hands, trying to reassure him. His guts churned as bad as they did on a punch-out. What if I'm not suitable for the procedure? Then you do something else, Becca said. She was smart, tough, and beautiful, and he loved her, but sometimes Becca's aw shucks perspective ignored reality. Maybe that was because she'd grown up in a good home, with loving parents. As a child, she'd never had to fight for food. If I can't play, I have to deal with Greedock. He'll come for me. He'll come for us, don't you know? We'll figure it out together, no matter what. She meant to sound supporting, but her words had the opposite effect. They reminded him that Greedock might target Becca, the Tweedies, Janine, everyone Quentin loved. Maybe we shouldn't get married, 
he said. If I can't play, I... Oh, put a sock in it, Barnes. You already popped the question. No takebacks. Besides, you might have more power than you think. If you can't win with your arm, why not try winning with your head? His head? He raised an eyebrow. The Krakens need a coach, Becca said. You came up with our Galaxy Bowl game plan. In case you haven't seen any newscasts this week, we came out on top. Greedock wants to win more than anything else. You could keep winning games for him, but from the sidelines. Stay in football as a coach? Quentin had never considered that before. He wondered if Hokor was in heaven somewhere, or in the quith equivalent of an afterlife, Petty Palps twitching hysterically at Becca's comment. Yes, Quentin had won as the default coach, and on the game's biggest stage. But much of that success came from surprise, from catching the Jupiter Jacks unaware. If other teams and other coaches were ready for him, could he still win games? Maybe. He knew the Krakens better than anyone else. He'd played under Hokor for five seasons. He knew coach's system inside and out. Would Greedock go for it? The room door slid open. Doc Ganagati floated in. We have your test results, she said. Miss Montaigne, please leave. This information is private. Becca can stay, Quinn said. I, I need her here. A mouth flap gestured to a chair next to the hospital bed. Very well, Mr. Barnes. Please have a seat. In the holo tank, a three-dimensional schematic of Quentin's left arm. Translucent skin, bone, muscle, and tendons, all done in faded colors. All except the bright red, ever-branching tree of interconnected nerves. Detail examination reveals that our procedure is not applicable to your particular injury, Ganagati said. Unfortunately, we can do nothing. However, this means you do not need to risk your safety. We can move on to alternatives for pain mitigation. Quentin grew angrier by the second. Pain mitigation. As if this were just a stubbed toe. And how am I supposed to play when I'm on drugs? Or maybe you think I should get some mods and take away the pain, is that it? Mods are my recommendation, yes, Ganagati said. Mr. Barnes, you need to face the reality that your playing career may be over. He wondered how she would feel if someone told her that her medical career might be over. She wouldn't be so damn calm then. You're shucking incompetent, Quentin said. Becca put a hand on his shoulder. Q, try and relax. Ganagati didn't seem upset by the accusation. I am beyond competent, the Haras said. My credentials are not in question, Mr. Barnes. I could give a squirt of piss about your credentials, you shucking hack. You're paid to fix me, so fix me. Ganagati's sensory pits twitched. Her wings undulated ever so slightly. The room lights played off the GFL logo etched atop her white backpack. I am sorry for what must be an emotionally trying situation, Mr. Barnes, but this isn't the first time you've been told this information. No one can fix you. He rose from his chair, fully intent on smashing the hurrah, on letting his fury rule him like some hidden puppet master working a remote control. A hand gripped his wrist, Becca's. Quentin, she said, take a seat. He faced her, feeling his rage swell, a fire glowing hotter from a steady, internal wind. Becca Montaigne didn't flinch. She leaned closer. Calm down, Q, she said. The doctor didn't cause your injury. Her words were just enough to take the edge off his anger, just enough to peel away that outer skin and lay bare what lie beneath. Fear. Quentin's energy drained away. If Ganagati was right, his career was over. He sat in the chair. He stared at the holo tank. Display off, Ganagati said. The multi-layered arm vanished, leaving red tracers that slowly faded from Quentin's vision. Ganagati floated in front of him, easily close enough to be grabbed before she could fly away. 
Quentin realized that was a brave thing for her to do. His powerful arms could crush her in a heartbeat. Modern medicine is a wonder, Ganagati said. But for all it can accomplish, there are still limits. Significant limits. Sometimes we simply do not have answers. Your nerves are damaged in a way that they send pain signals when you put torque on your elbow joint. As you've experienced, that includes your throwing motion. I'm quite familiar with where it hurts, Quentin said. Tell me why you can't fix me. The artificial voice coming from Ganagati's backpack softened, took on a more sympathetic tone. The nerve damage is too severe. The shrapnel cut through so much of your arm, it's astounding you have normal function at all. It isn't my place to say so, but you should be grateful you have full use of your hand instead of being angry you can't throw a football. He should be grateful? He looked at the fingers of his traitorous left hand. He made a fist. Even that small movement shot a pang of pain up from his elbow. She thought he couldn't play? Shuck that. He'd managed pain his whole life. Why was this any different? He would find a way to eliminate the pain, or he would learn to play through it. We're done here, Quentin said. He stood. Ganagati floated backward, giving him room. Best of luck to you, Mr. Barnes. I'll continue to look for a way to fix your arm. Don't bother, Quentin said. I'll find someone who knows what they're doing. Quentin walked out of the room, leaving Becca and the hurrah behind. Maybe Becca would apologize for him, maybe not. He didn't care. And now a word from this episode's sponsor, Audible. Visit audible.com slash Sigler or text Sigler, S-I-G-L-E-R, to 500-500 to start your free 30-day trial. As you know, A and I dig Audible. We have all our books for sale there, OBS, but we're also very happy customers. I pound audiobooks like they were Pez, and if audiobooks were bullets, a real girl would be one heavily armed bandito. We listen while we walk the pups, while we do housework, while we fix up the place, while we exercise, etc. And it's not just audiobooks anymore. With an Audible Plus membership, you get full access to the Plus catalog which is filled with thousands of titles across different formats. Audiobooks, sure, but also popular and exclusive podcasts and unique Audible originals like Jonathan Mayberry's work. You can download or stream all of it without limit, and you can listen offline anytime, anywhere. To use your Audible membership, you'll need to download the Audible app. The Audible app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. You can listen across devices like Amazon Alexa-enabled devices without losing your spot. That's awesome! So check it out. Visit audible.com slash Sigler or text Sigler to 500-500 to start your free 30-day trial. And now back to our story. Chodo stood in the hall, an ever-present sentinel still wearing his black trench coat and sunglass. At the sight of Quentin, Chodo glanced up one side of the hall, then down the other, checking for danger before he spoke. Is the prognosis positive? Quentin didn't answer. He leaned his back against the wall next to the door of his room. He crossed his arms. Your posture is not indicative of celebratory emotions, Chodo said. What the hell do doctors know anyway? An enormous amount. That is how they become doctors. Shut up, Chodo. Quentin stared at the floor. Pata was wrong. Ganagati was wrong. There was a way to fix his arm. He would not accept anything less. Potential threat, Chodo said quietly. To your right. Quentin waited a beat, then glanced right. Five sentients in the hall, spaced out down the length. A key on a long stretcher. Covered by a thin blanket, a brown-haired human nurse in pale green scrubs, pushing the stretcher along. A human and a hurrah, both wearing surgical blues, looking at the same message board and talking softly to each other. And, at the end of the hall, coming closer, a man wearing pale green scrubs, scrubs that were far too tight. And your left. Chodo said. 
his words barely a whisper. Quentin glanced left. At the end of the hall, two men in maintenance worker clothes, one with a hard hat, one with a blue ball cap, walking a bit too quickly. Each carried a bag. Quentin's eyes met theirs, and in that instant, he knew they had come for him. We need cover, Chodo said. In your hospital room. Move. His back still against the wall, Quentin casually slid the door open. The maintenance workers reached into their bags. Quentin spun into the room, Chodo right behind him. An angry huff of air, a chunk of the door's synthetic frame splintered to bits. Chodo slid the door shut, but it wouldn't close all the way. Becca stepped in front of Ganagati, the big heavy G body protecting the frail hurrah. Q, what was that? Gunshot, Chodo said. Silenced high-caliber weapon. We are in danger. Becca stepped to the empty hospital bed. She grabbed it, pulled, the locked wheels refused to give, then something in them snapped. She shoved the bed toward Shoto, who caught it, flipped it on its end, wedged it against the door. Quentin scanned the room. No windows, no other doors. No time to go back into the hall, not with the attackers coming. The walls. Follow me, Quentin said. He rushed toward the wall. At his first step, time slowed. At his second step, the room seemed to change, to morph into a world of light and flowing energy. Lines of power, the same thing he sometimes saw in a football field, formed on the vertical wall panels. The lines of power were brightest in the center of each panel. There, hopefully, the wall's strength would be the weakest. He lowered his shoulder. His 380-pound body punched through the panel, ripping open a quentin size hole. A cry of surprise from the room's lone patient, but Quentin didn't slow. Three more strides took him to the far wall. He drove through that one as well. His foot caught on the edge of this new hole. He stumbled, hit the floor hard, and skidded. Time slammed back to normal. A hospital bed, an elderly blue-skinned woman in it. The hell is this? The woman said. Becca, grabbing at Quentin, lifting him. Q, get up! He stood just as Chodo came through the hole. Time had returned to normal, but the strange lines of power remained. Quentin was as unable to explain them now as he was when they lit up his view of the gridiron. He realized that as he'd torn through the walls, he'd been moving the opposite way of the gunman who had been rushing down the hall toward his exam room door. Shock me, the elderly woman said. Are you Quentin Barnes? In seconds, the gunman would pursue through the holes in the walls. There is a fire escape, Chodo said. Left out of this room, right at the corner. Get that human off the bed. Becca scooped up the old woman an instant before Chodo grabbed the sides of the hospital bed, ripped it free from its moorings. Becca quickly, gently set the old woman on the floor. Ganagati fluttered through the hole in the wall. They're coming, she said, just before that huff sound, just before a bullet entered somewhere near her tail, erupted out a sensory pit in a cloud of pink blood and billowing yellow gas. The hurrah doctor dropped. Her twitching wings slapped a spastic bead against the tile floor. Her blood splattered out, along with more jets of gas. Becca reached for her. She's dead, Chodo shouted, hefting the hospital bed higher. Open the door. Quentin slid it open. Chodo went through first, the bed facing back down the hall. Becca rushed out, headed left, Quentin a step behind her. Woof, woof. Bullets blew fist-sized holes through the hospital bed's mattress. Becca and Quentin sprinted for the corner. Chodo backpedaled along after them, holding the bed toward the unseen gunman. Quentin passed Becca, turned the corner, saw a red fire escape door just ten yards away. People in the hall cowered, wide-eyed with surprise and fear, not at the gunshots, which made little noise, but at him, at the seven-foot-tall, muscled monster sprinting their way. Just in front of the fire escape door stood the nurse who had been pushing the motionless key. She snapped her right arm down. A gleaming, foot-long blade slid from her pale green sleeve into her hand. Quentin had to take her out. 
Without breaking stride, he launched himself at the nurse's legs, hoping to slide under the blade and knock her on her ass. She somersaulted over him. Quentin shot past beneath, slammed into a rolling cart. Equipment rattled off, clattered against the floor. Becca was only a few steps behind. She stepped to the nurse, threw a right cross. The nurse moved, slightly, effortlessly, and Becca's punch hit empty air. The nurse drove her sword hilt into Becca's exposed armpit. Becca cried out, fell against the wall, her right arm hanging limp as if it had no bones at all. In an instant, this nurse had slipped past Quentin and Becca. The blade in her hand, the way she moved, she could have sliced either of them, sliced them deep. She had not. Shoto came around the corner. The hospital bed a mess of broken plastic, torn fabric, and shredded cushion. Bits of fluff spreading through the air as bullets ripped through it. The woman ducked under the bed, pulled up short at the hallway corner, the blade in her right hand. Drop the bed, Quentin shouted at Shoto. Come on! Quentin slammed open the fire escape door. Becca started through. Quentin stopped her. Shoto dropped the bed and went first rushing ahead to face any unexpected danger. The warrior left a trail of blood in his wake. The first gunman turned the corner. The nurse grabbed his right wrist, angling his pistol barrel toward the floor. She drove her blade into his belly and up into his chest. The man stumbled, fell. The nurse now held his silenced pistol. She pressed her back flat against the corner, waiting. From down the fire escape, Chodo called out. Quentin pushed Becca through the door and started after her, but he paused for an instant, unable to look away. Hard hat and ball cap came around the corner, moving fast. The woman snap kicked Hard hat's knee, sent him sprawling forward. Ball cap reacted instantly. He kept his gun close to his ribs so she couldn't grab it, ripped off three fast shots. But before he'd pulled the trigger, the nurse had already spun her body out of harm's way. She didn't dodge Ballcap's bullets as much as she moved her body to where the bullets weren't going. Her blade snapped out, sank into Ballcap's right eye. He went stiff. She yanked the blade free, aimed her captured pistol at Hardhat, who was trying to get up, his ruined knee bent at the wrong angle. The nurse fired twice. Woof, woof. The man's blood and brains splashed under the hospital walls and floor. The hard hat spun away. Both attackers, already dead, hit the ground at the same time. Quentin felt frozen. The nurse looked his way. Their eyes met. You should go, she said. Not a yell, not an order, just a simple statement of fact her voice as normal as if she was telling him the scores of yesterday's games. Quentin rushed through the fire escape door, almost ran Becca over. Q, are you hit? No, I'm fine. Shoto shouted up from below. The way is clear. Fred will meet us on the street. Becca and Quentin started down together, careful not to step in the wet lines of Chodo's blood. Somewhere in the hospital, an alarm sounded. Quentin and Becca reached the 20th floor, then the 15th. The alarm continued to blare. Sentience rushed through the 10th floor's fire escape door. Quentin eyed each person in a flash glance, wondering if they were yet another attacker, here to kill him, to kill Becca. The fleeing sentience scrambled down the steps, focused only on their flight. Fire escape doors banged open on every floor, sentients of many species joining in the urgent yet orderly escape headed for the street. Shoes clattered against concrete, their echoes mostly drowned out by the sound of the alarm. At the fifth floor landing, Quentin and Becca caught up to Chodo. Blood soaked the left leg of his sweatpants, dark gray stains on the light gray fabric. He leaned heavily on the handrail, unable to run any farther. I got him, Becca said. Chodo weighed 400 pounds. Becca threw him over her shoulders as if he was no more than a child. Quentin stepped past them, knowing he had to lead the way out, knowing he had to face any further threats. Sentience flooded the fire escape, 
Human and Quith and Amphib and Heavy G and Hurrah and Key. Any one of them might be an assailant. Quentin roared, his bellowing voice in big body, clearing a path through the patients and hospital staff. Becca lumbered down the steps behind him, Chodo's blood dripping onto the stairs. They reached the ground floor. Sentience fled out a heavy red door. Quentin stood aside, scanned the sentience rushing past. He saw a fluttering hurrah, snatched it by its undulating wings. Release me, the hurrah said, his backpack voice mechanical and calm. Are you a doctor? I am a medtech. Close enough, Quentin said. You're coming with us. Captured, hurrah held tight. Quentin exited the building, Becca close behind, Chodo still over her shoulders. All around, sentience ran down the sidewalk, sprinted out onto the street, anywhere that led away. Approaching sirens, klaxon calls reverberating over the concrete canyon's walls, ground traffic screeching to a halt, horns blaring. Up above, layers of cars and cabs flew past, tangled city traffic unaffected by the hospital shootout. I don't see Fred, Quentin said. Me neither, Becca said. Q, Chodo's hurt bad. Across the street, a coffee shop. Window lined with patrons gawking at the bustle of sentience fleeing for their lives. There, Quentin said. Come on. He crossed the street. The hurrah held firm. Quentin kicked open the coffee shop door. Patrons made room, maybe because of the blood, maybe because of the size of three GFL players rushing in. Quentin pointed at the lunch counter. Put Chodo there. Let me go, the hurrah said. Quentin ignored him. Becca set Chodo on the counter. So much blood. You idiot, the hurrah said. If you don't release me, I can't help the warrior. Quentin let go. The hurrah flew to Chodo. Mouth flaps grabbed the bloody sweatpants, ripped them apart, exposing a bullet wound in Chodo's thigh. You, female heavy G, the hurrah said. What is your name? Becca. Find me clean towels, Becca. Now. Quentin leaned in, looked at the wound. Is he going to be okay? Not if you don't give me room to work, the hurrah said. Step back. Quentin did. He turned, saw most of the sentience in the diner looking at him. A sclorno female, dressed head to toe in black, started hopping up and down. Quentin Barnes, Quentin Barnes, Quentin Barnes, Quentin Barnes, Quentin Barnes. People pointed, turned to each other, whispered. Quentin heard Fred's voice, muffled and tinny. He reached past the hurrah, slid his hand into Chota's sweatpants pocket, found the small comms unit. Fred, this is Quentin. We were attacked. Chota's hurt. We're in the coffee shop across the street from Randall. On my way, Fred said. I'll find the next nearest hospital. Quentin moved to the window, saw police cruisers dropping down. A blue van lowered. Black armored cops poured out of it. They rushed into the hospital, through the same fire escape door that sentients were still coming out of. Quentin turned, stared hard at the diner patrons. They backed away, their half-smiles turning to wide-eyed expressions of concern. They were caught between the thrill of seeing an intergalactic celebrity and the fact that said intergalactic celebrity dwarfed them all. Quentin, Becca said, come here. He did. Becca held Chodo's petty palp hand. The warrior's eye was closed. The hurrah's mouth flaps cinched towels tight around Chodo's thigh. Only a few red blood spots stained the white cloth. Shiny surgical instruments lay scattered on the lunch counter. Smears of red streaked the hurrah's backpack. The bullet went right through, the hurrah said. I clamped his arteries, stopped the bleeding. The wound is stabilized. Your friend will be all right as long as we get him into surgery within the hour. If we don't, he'll lose the leg. Quentin glanced across the diner, through the window. Black armored cops filled the street, directing ground vehicles to turn around and find other routes. A familiar yellow hover cab lowered to the sidewalk right outside the diner. Quentin turned back to the hurrah. Thank you for saving my friend. You are welcome, the hurrah said. By the way, I hate your team. Earthlings or bust. You have been listening to The Gangster, book six in the Galactic Football League series, written and narrated by Scott Sigler. 
Follow Scott on Instagram and Twitter, where he is at Scott Ziegler, one word, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Scott Ziegler. For more information on the Galactic Football League series and for more free audiobook podcasts, visit scottsigler.com. The Gangster was directed by A. Sigler, engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2020, Empty Set Entertainment. Theme music is the song They're Watching Me by the band Super Weapon. <laughs> <laughs>